Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The late 19th century in Korea was a period of great political and social turmoil. Japanese interference culminates in the assassination of Queen Min and King Kojong later seeking refuge in the Russian legation. At the same time, Korea is confronted with vast-scale civil strife as those Koreans hostile to the growing influence of foreign nations foment riots and angry mobs roam the streets of Seoul. This is the Korea the Sills witnessed between early 1894 and the later months of 1896. John Sill, who had been sent to Seoul as ambassador of the United States, and his wife, Sally Sill, wrote a steady stream of letters to their children and acquaintances who had remained in America. The Sills' correspondence is a remarkable account of the lives of Westerners in Korea, the tensions between Western influence and traditional values, Japan's gradual power grab on the peninsula, and of the dying days of the Chosun dynasty. Our guest for this episode is Robert Neff, who transcribed the Sills' letters and undertook meticulous research to contextualize them for the general public and scholars alike. The result of his hard work is a fascinating book, Letters from Chosun, 19th Century Korea Through the Eyes of an American Ambassador's Wife, a detailed account of life and politics during a critical period of late Chosun, as seen by the Sills. Robert Neff is a freelance writer and historical researcher specializing in Korean history during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He has authored and co-authored several books, including The Lives of Westerners in Chosun, Korea, and Korea Through Western Eyes. His writings have appeared in various publications, including Christian Science Monitor, Asia Times, Ten Magazine, Korea Times, and the Korea Herald. Robert Neff's current research focuses on Western gold mining concessions in Northern Korea between 1883 and 1939. Robert Neff, welcome to Korea in the World. And thank you very much. What brought you to Korea originally, and how did you choose to focus on late Chosun Korea, and in particular, the lives of Westerners during those times? I came to Korea with the military in 1984, and I've been here pretty much since. Uh, after completing my military term, I realized I couldn't write contemporary because of the field I was in. And so I decided to go back about 100 years, an open area, and I wanted to see what the foreigners experienced then and how different it was from what I was experiencing. Korean in 1984 was a lot different than it is now. A huge difference. Korea in 1883 was a huge difference from what it was in 1984. It was an open area and I, I grabbed it. What can we learn about late 19th century Korea through Western eyes that is different from local sources? What kind of original insight do you think we can, we can gather from these uh, testimonies, let's say? Well, I think the advantage I have is that I'm using Western sources, sources that aren't usually used by academia. I buy and collect large numbers of postcards, letters. I'm the king of spam. If your family's name is Smith and you're from Indiana, well, I know that there was a Smith here in Korea in 1897. So I send out emails to all the Smiths in that city, or I call them and I ask them, Hokshi, by chance, did you have a relative that lived here about a hundred years ago? And you'd be surprised at the number of people that you do end up finding. Uh, the book that I'm writing now is Nodaji, the Western gold mining experience. I have contacted literally thousands of people. And out of that, I have found maybe 40 families. And these families have their old diaries. They have their father's or grandfather's uh, transcripts that he published or he taped for his children so that they would know what it was like back that time. Academia generally doesn't have access to that. Academia generally concentrates on the political documents, the documents from the embassies, mm -hmm. um, the missionary letters, but they miss the common people. And I'm also very big on skimming newspapers. Hometown newspapers are a great source of information. Small newspapers had nothing to publish. So when a letter came from Korea to John Smith's house, it, would it became story. big news. And they would often copy it straight out. And I, I think in my book, Letters from Chosun, Sill got into trouble 
for that because his sister-in-law took a letter and had it sent to the family and they published it in entirety in the local newspaper and the State Department was rather upset. So this material you're using, would you say that it's very objective, that it provides us with a fair assessment of the Korea of the time or did you still have to dig past you know, layers of prejudice uh, in those writings? Oh, of course you have to dig past and you have to, you have to try to be balanced to get over the biases. There, there are biases from that age Uh, I mean, obviously racial biases, mm. and depending on what the period is, if it's the early 1900s, we have anti-Japanese biases, 1890s, 1880s, we have anti-Chinese, you have anti-Russian, it just depends on who's doing the talking and what period we're talking about. So today we're focusing on your book, Letters from Chosun, 19th Century Korea Through the Eyes of an American Ambassador's Wife. Can you maybe situate the book for our listeners? What years are we talking about and how was the political situation in Korea as well as between Korea and the United States? Well, it takes place from 1894 until 1896 and it is a turbulent period. War is on the horizon. We have China and Japan getting ready to go to war and Sil's family comes to Korea mainly because of political connections. He voted for the right party. And so it's, you do me well, I'll do you well. And they sent him off to Korea. Korea wasn't important to the United States. If it was important, you would have never sent a teacher from the Central Plain area, the Great Lakes region. But they sent him. And he gets to Korea in a horrible position. He's here during the Tongok Revolution. Eastern the, Learning. The Eastern Learning, right. And it's all throughout the Cholodo provinces. I think it's a month after he gets here, war is declared. So he, he has no time. He, he hits the ground running right from the beginning. For the book, obviously not all of the letters were published. But as you read these letters, you can see the uncertainty. Korea is still an exotic land, but it's really dangerous to people. So yes, your book is based on the actual correspondence between Sally Sill, the wife of then U.S. Ambassador John Mahan Barry Sill and her family. Uh, you extensively quote the letters as much as possible. How did you gain access to the original material? Uh, the original material, Professor Lu Yong Yik provided me with copies of them. He had been given them, um, I think, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. He never did anything with them. They were all photocopied. Nobody knows where the originals are. The only copies of these that exist is one microfilm, and nobody knows the source of the material, nothing. He gave me the copies of them. I eventually ran down surviving family members. Again, spam. I have to search. Genealogy is great. But uh, I eventually tracked down some of the family, and while most of the book does concentrate on theirs, I also pull sources from other places. Again, I go to the hometown newspapers from these people. I look at the missionaries and their writings from that time period. I, the naval officers, the diplomatic sources. I also look at the diplomatic official documents and compare them between the letters being written home and the letters being written to the State Department. Mm. And they don't always correspond with each other very well. So as you mentioned, uh, Ambassador Sill was a member of uh, the Michigan, let's call it, gentry, uh, with little to no experience in international affairs. So I understand there was, he, as you said, he voted for the right party, but still, how could a man like him, who had really no connections whatsoever with the world of diplomacy, be tasked with U.S.-Korea relations? And what does this tell us about the significance of Chosun at the time for a major power such as the U.S.? Well, he may not have been connected politically meaning the big powers, but he was connected locally. And it's those local connections that eventually got him his position. As I said, Korea wasn't viewed that well in the United States. It, it wasn't, wasn't something that we really wanted to get involved in. We didn't have that much interest here. We don't really gain interest in Korea until after Sill leaves. And that's through his uh, subordinate, Horace Allen. Horace Allen was doing a lot of things at this time, and Sill wasn't always in on him. Allen had his own agenda, and he was working towards Allen. When Sill got his position, it was, you know, as I said earlier, it was just a thank you for supporting me job, and 
Here, you can go to Korea. It's a nice, quiet place. You like spiders and flowers. You can go study the spiders and flowers. And he, he did. He wrote a lot about spiders and flowers. Uh, and he used to give lectures at the Seoul Union, which was their club in Chongdong. He would give lectures to him. His sister-in-law, who was a budding photographer, she would assist him. They would go out in the garden. They would take all these pictures of all these spiders and... That was it. And according to his wife, the lectures were well received. But I haven't seen anybody else say that. Uh, I'm, I can imagine they were pretty boring. What's quite striking in your book is this overarching colonial mindset that you can really feel. All the Westerners Lady Sill meets uh, are in Korea to either develop the country, whatever that means, or to convert. And in the very beginning of your book, there's a great story about how Ambassador Sill somehow menaces to not meet the king if he is not allowed through the main gate at the Gyeongbokgung Palace. Is that something that you really felt, uh, that they consider the Korean polity as somehow inferior, that they are here on a, on a civilizational mission? This period, you see the great white knight coming all the time. Uh, and it's a constant thing. You people need to be civilized. What is civilization? It's a matter of perspective. Korea was a very civilized country at the time, but it wasn't Western civilization. For Sil, I think my favorite story with him and the Korean bureaucracy was his age. When he went to the first meeting, they asked him, how old are you? And he told them, he looked young. They were, oh, you're lying to us. You're not that old. Yeah. Because, and he was like, wow, people think I'm lying because I say I'm old. God, yeah, I should just, I should lie and say I'm young. It makes them feel better, you know. And it's completely opposite from us. Hmm. The ideal was to look younger, and the Koreans wanted to look older. And in fact, even Kojong lied about his age one time. He added a couple of years to it to make himself older. It, it happens more after Sil leaves that we see this development of Korea. Everything that you look at, Allen's always mixed up in development. Prior to Sill coming, we have the early gold mine efforts. Those were Allen's efforts. While Sill's in charge, Allen is working underneath him, behind the lines, trying to set himself up for the future. Allen's the one doing all of these things. Uh, the Seoul Chimneypole Railroad. That's done under Sill, but Sill gets no credit for it because it's Allen's efforts. The Unsan gold mines which, as I said, I was, I'm writing about now, that's all under Allen. You, even when Lay Smith Hunt comes to Korea, the Seals have no idea who they are, even though Seals' wife knows Lay Hunt Smith's wife, but she had never met her husband. And who is he? Lay, Lay Hunt Smith is the man who developed the Unsan Gold Mines, mm. the Oriental Consolidated Mining Company. They have no idea who he is. All of these people coming in and out of Korea, the Sill family don't really know who they are. It's Alan pulling all these strings. My impression of Sill is he's weak at best. He's, he's not a very good diplomat. He's somebody that you would see out in the, the countryside. He's a that minister, and he was an ordained minister. He's a minister at church. He comes out, he greets you, he pats you on the back talks about the price of hogs and wheat, and that's about it. But other than that, he wasn't a great diplomat. He, he tried his best, but he, was, he wanted to be friends with everybody. So would you consider that Ambassador Sill has a legacy, or he was just... He had no legacy. Going through, yeah. <laughs> there was no legacy with him. The only thing I like about him is sometimes he would call people out. During the 1894, just as it closes, we have the American Navy in the area at Chimyopol. And one of the missionary's wives goes around spreading rumors that the American Navy is out there molesting the Korean women and they're drunk and they're, they're always causing this trouble and they're a disgrace. And the State Department sends a letter or sends word to Sill, get to the bottom of this. Sill calls the commander of the, the Navy the Asiatic fleet, mm -hmm. and demands answers. And they turn out and they get that missionary and his wife in, and Sill demands to know, who did you see do these things? Well, I never actually saw anybody. 
Where did you get this story from? Oh, one of my Korean friends told me. Who's the Korean friend? I don't remember. And so one of the things that Sil says is Samuel Moore and his wife, basically they're hotheads, but they're liars. Good missionary liars. He, he called it as he saw it. During the Sil stay, cholera actually hits Korea. Sure. And so the mostly uneducated locals take refuge in superstition to hopefully curb the illness's spread. But there you see U.S. doctors on site try to translate and print dozens of thousands of circulars teaching these basic health tips and providing care and, and building dispensaries or, or a surefire way for Western missionaries to, well, to win hearts and minds. And can you maybe tell us a bit more about this as seen through uh, Mrs. Uh, Sill's eyes? Cholera is a, a big problem. In fact, this, this wasn't the first encounter with cholera in Korea. Okay, we know in 18, I think it's 1821, cholera swept through the country. It was so horrible that they had way stations along the, the main roads so that they could go out and bury the people. 18, I think it was 1886 is the first Western experience with it here in Korea. And again, it was so bad that I think Horace Allen wrote that the hills looked like they were bleeding because of all the red soil dug up from all the graves. 1894, the cholera epidemic was severe too. The Western missionaries were doing it, but you left out the Japanese. The Japanese were also very working very hard on curbing this. They provided a lot of help, but they're never mentioned. Were the Koreans superstitious? Sure they were, but they were desperate, and they were doing whatever they could to curb this. You have to remember that literally the streets were filled with people dying all the time. And the Koreans had more of a, a fatalistic view about things. It was expensive to bury people. And you could only take the corpses out of the corpse gates. There were only two gates that you could take them out of. You have to find somebody to transport these bodies. It's expensive. People would sometimes take their children and tie them to the trees outside the city. That way the child would die outside the city and they wouldn't have to pay for the funeral expenses. Even the missionaries, one of their hospitals had a humongous mortality rate. I think it was in 1902 during the cholera epidemic then that Korea actually set up concentration camps where they would take people with cholera and put them all in these quarantine centers. It didn't matter if you had it or didn't have it. I mean, you were placed in there and you eventually came up with it. You also uh, write about uh, Mrs. Sill's social life. It sure. mostly happens through um, small private gatherings. What would a typical Western Westerner in Korea in 1984 do for entertainment? What should we imagine there? Male or female? Let's start with females since we're talking All about right. Mrs. Sill. Well, females would usually gather at Seoul Union. Mm -hmm. They had the tennis parties. They would go out and play tennis, and if they weren't playing tennis, they were having tea parties where the women would go and serve tea, and every woman in the Chongdong area, she had her time that she had to do it. She, each one took their turns to do it, and they would bake cakes, and they would serve each other. It was a great gossip area. The one thing that's really wonderful about American sources, and European sources are horrible, American sources always have gossip. I mean, we love gossip. And for me, one of the things about the gossip that I really got me by surprise was when I was reading one of the Sills' letters and they mentioned the British ambassador and mentioned that he had children but no wife. Now, I knew the wife had laid the cornerstone at the British embassy or legation, but there's no wife. And so I started to investigate why there was no wife. Where was she? Why wouldn't they know? If she was visiting somewhere, we would know about it. She wasn't visiting. She eloped. She was having an affair with an Irish member of the Korean customs, and she took off with him. She went back to England with him, and the British ambassador had to actually go back to England and follow her and divorce her there. And he got custody of all the children. And so the strange thing is, the foreign community in Korea did not talk about it. As for other activities, the women would go and go to each other's houses. It's not in this book, but the bicycle was also introduced at this time, and women started riding bicycles. 
not all the women were looked upon in a favorable way. Some women thought it was unmannerly of a woman to ride a bicycle. And they went on small excursions. They went on picnics to Pukansan. They stayed, Sil didn't, but some of the other women stayed in the Buddhist temples around Seoul, outside the walls. Um, Horace Allen led a number of excursions to the, the historic sites in Seoul. And what about the men? Billiards. Everybody played pool, drinking. One of my favorite stories about, we have the Soul Club here in Seoul. It's one of the oldest, oldest organizations. It actually gets its beginning from the German club, about 1888. And that comes about because the Russian ambassador's wife, Weber, didn't like the German representative. And so she accused him of having orgies in the German legation. And on Christmas, 1888, he went to the missionary's house for the Christmas party, and they wouldn't let him in. They told him, your type isn't wanted here. And he was kind of offended because he was a diplomat. And eventually the story came out that Weber's wife had been spreading rumors to the missionary women about womanizing in, the, uh, in his legation. And so the Germans decided to make their own club, and the missionaries weren't invited. And so we eventually have these clubs come up, and that's where the men could go and drink, play pool. Some of the young diplomats would go there, and they would drink. And it was away from the prying eyes of women, and no tis, tis, tis coming out at front. And the men went out hunting and, you know, manly things. Mm. Again, a very uh, off question, but what about pets in, in Western legations? I remember there is a very particular one in the Russian embassy. Everybody had pets. Everybody. Uh, Sontag, Madame Sontag, who had Sontag Hotel later, she had pets. Sally has a number of pets, but probably the most important pet was, and it wasn't really a pet, it was a tiger. At the Russian legation, a mother tiger was killed. And so they had the baby cub. And the cub was given to King Kojo by one of his people. And he wasn't too thrilled with it. He didn't want this cub. But the women would come over. It was a very popular subject for the women. And they, the Sally, Sally and her sister, Alice, would go over to take pictures of this ferocious tiger. Because tigers in Korea were ferocious. Um, Just like in the Korean stories and legends. There were leopards. The German legation had to flee in the middle of the night one day because a leopard crawled into the legation. They were hunting tigers at uh, Chongdokun because they would crawl over Stripling, who runs the police force. Uh, he's mentioned a couple of times. He's an elderly man. He actually went hunting for a tiger in one of the sewers. And he had his Korean hunter with him, and the guy wanted to impress this great white hunter, and he thought he saw the big cat sneak out through one of the back entrances, so he said, I'll go in and get this tiger. And he's convinced that tiger is gone. It wasn't, I think it was a leopard, but they thought it was a tiger. And so he crawls into that sewer, but it's not gone. So he comes out pretty quickly. He's a little scratched up, but uh, he, he didn't want to go back in there. Tigers were such a problem in Korea, but they also had, they provided you with a way out. Hmm. If I owe you a lot of money, I just go get some old clothes, rip them up, put some pig blood on it, and then go out near the forest somewhere, throw my clothes down, and then get out of the country. It was the best way of avoiding your debts. You just pretended that you had been killed by the tiger. And then you go to another part of the country and nobody looks for you. But this tiger was inside the Russian legation, and you see Sally talking about it constantly. Ah, we went in to take pictures. Ah, the little thing scratched us, you know, so we hit it on the head to make it stop. And eventually this tiger was given to the Webbers, and I think it was sent to Russia and placed in a zoo. Uh, Kojong did not want this tiger. Pets were a big thing, and wild animals were a big thing. The seals had their wild animals, their deer. William Franklin Sands had his deer. People had bears. 
They were good to keep away unwanted guests. Sometimes the deer got a little randy. Being scratched wasn't always the worst thing that could happen to you. So when the seal arrive in Korea for the first time, they mostly deal with Japanese, besides Westerners, of course. Um, it seems that the Westerners and the Japanese are rather in, in good terms in 1894. Well, the Koreans are clearly, I would say, second-class citizens from what we read. Uh, even the Japanese consul seems to be Western. Um, do the Sills immediately recognize that the colonization and takeover process of Korea by the Japanese is well underway? And do they support it? Do they oppose it? I don't think there's a colonization effort at this time. Nobody yeah. really sees it like that. Um, the Sill family are very close to the Japanese at the time. Uh, but you can see that once the assassination of Queen Min change, uh, happens, that Sally Sill's impression of the Japanese has changed too. Mm. She's now very negative. She, she's demanding in her letters that they be punished, that they have committed this horrendous crime because Sally was very close to Queen Min. Even though they had met only a couple of times, mm. she was very impressed with her. John was, uh, I, I think he became very suspicious of the Japanese afterwards too. His, his manner is much more stricter with them. He's more harsh, he's more demanding. I, I think they felt betrayed. Just a, a quick history point. Can you maybe explain um, well, what happened exactly, the assassination of the Queen Min? Why did the Japanese uh, get rid of her? Queen Men was seen as a problem. She was uh, a progressive woman. She was a very intelligent woman, a very strong woman, and they needed to get rid of her. We get the sense through the book of really a, a retrograde society in Korea. I don't want to use a derogatory term, but really hierarchy is omnipresent. Korean and, and Western officials alike travel through town on their sedan chairs attended by their servants, the kisus. Um, and once the Japanese take over Seoul, uh, many Koreans seek refuge in the U.S. legation and the ambassador ha has these really harsh words. He says they're useless because they're, they're even afraid to disobey their own noblemen. So but at the same time, as you mentioned, modernization is taking place uh, in, in, in Korea. That's, uh, I think that's a big part of the book as well. So how do the tensions between tradition and moder modernity play out in, in Lady Sill's letters? Uh, the only thing I can really think about offhand right away is the introduction of the streetcars, and the railroad. Coming from Chemyopo or Incheon to Seoul, you either had to do it overland, which was 26 miles. There were various ways you could do it. You could go by foot. You could go on Korean pony, which were extremely vicious little animals. These animals were so vicious that they were displayed in a, a traveling circus in Texas in 1888, and they were called devil horses. They were vicious animals. One missionary said that he learned more humility from one of those little ponies than he learned in seminary school. <laughs> but uh, you also could go by gin rickshaw, and still actually like going by gin rickshaw. But the problem with gin rickshaw was the Korean runners weren't very skilled at it, and they often dumped the passenger into the ditch. Or you could go by steamer. And the steamers were constantly running aground or sinking, and so it, was, it wasn't a very good thing. The railroad was going to provide fast service between them, but it wasn't viewed by all in a positive way. For the Westerners, it was a great idea. But for a lot of Koreans, it was seen as the end of their livelihood because now they wouldn't be able to do, they wouldn't be able to transport these things. They had a lot of pull, these coolies. Same thing in Seoul. Once the Seoul Electric Railroad is set up, you don't need to have all these coolies all the time. The Seoul Electric Railroad actually changed the closing of the gates because they were going running in and out of the gates. And so the gates were no longer closed at night, except for during the Tongox. Um, women were out in front. And they were displayed to the world. I mean, the women gained more power. Modernization was clashing with Korean. So we see that during the drought, the Koreans believed that the electric railroad had crossed over the dragon's back. And so it was in anger that it was withholding the rains from Korea at this time. But if you read Sill's letters, you can see that the city's flooded at one time. So I guess the dragon got over it and let things go. 
So despite the feeling of security from living inside the U.S. legation, there is, as you mentioned, great unrest in Korea at the time. And those opposing westernization have gathered under the banner you mentioned, the, the Dongak uh, um, movement. And at some point, King Kojong is even compelled to ask China for help with putting down the, the rebellion. Do you feel anxiety in Lady Seal's letters? Um, how does she narrate these, these events? Oh, there's anxiety all the time. Um, the attack on the palace, our Chinese tailor ran into the legation seeking help. He was convinced that he was going to be killed. You have Koreans seeking refuge in the American legation, depending on the whims of the political whims at the time. She's reporting that the armies are coming closer and closer. They're now 20 miles away. They're now 12 miles away. They're going to kill all the foreigners. Um, the missionaries are hearing rumors. So yeah, she's writing about that a lot. And she's telling her family back home, you know, don't be too concerned. We're well guarded here. We have soldiers. One of our soldiers is worth 10 of the Tonghawks. But what she's writing her son is different from what she's writing her daughter. For her son, who's younger, she's being more stoic. Daddy's going to save us. We're in the legation. We're protected. But with like the daughter, we see a little bit more worry there. And with the sister, the sister writing to her family, it's the same thing. She's a little bit more, we're in a serious situation here. So the, the Sills also uh, witnessed the gradual takeover of Korea by the Japanese. How did they, and Westerners generally in Korea, apprehended that? Did they welcome Japanese efforts to quote-unquote civilize Korea, which was of course mirroring Western colonialism elsewhere, so something they, they could understand, or did they worry about Korea's loss of, of independence? Well, it, again, it depends on what time we're talking about. Mm. Um, during the, the reforms, the Koreans have to cut their hair short. The top knot must go. And you see many references. Oh, the Koreans look much better with their top knot cut off, and oh, they, you know, they're very handsome now and stuff. And then you also see the references about ghost stories. We start getting ghost stories about the areas near the Independent Gate that there's tokebis, goblins out there, and they cut off the top knots, and that's how people are explaining why they're missing their top knots. These reforms, this this cutting of the hair is endangering the city hmm. because nobody is going to come into the city because they're going to have their hair cut. So supplies aren't coming in. And it's not just food. One of the important things, because this is winter time, is brush. There's no firewood. People are freezing to death. So it's becoming a really, really big issue. Hmm. So they have to rescind that reform. Then there's a lot of references to Koreans all dressed up in Western style clothing and they look much, much better. And even the missionaries on Kangwa Island are laughing about it. What they're not laughing about is King Kojong being forced to cut his hair by a Japanese barber. They thought that was a little bit overboard. Uh, in the Sills letters, there are a lot of references as to how much the Japanese want to be considered as Western. And so based on, on this assumption, the Sills try to guess what the Japanese would do next. Um, why is that so? Why, why is there this idea that the Japanese want to be like, like, like them? Well, the Japanese are wearing Western clothing. Mm -hmm. The embassy has got Western furniture. They're acting Western in a lot of ways. They speak English, a number of them. I, I think they see it as, again, it's the great white knight story, you know, we are the civilization and everybody's trying to emulate us, and including the Japanese. But the Japanese have their own style and even the seals acknowledge that. They're not exactly emulating us 100%. They have their agendas and they're following it. We would never do that. Um, on the 23rd of July, 1894, the Japanese storm of Seoul and take the palace. Uh, Kim Kojong is torn between seeking asylum at, at one of the Western legations and remaining in his, well, soon-to-be overrun palace, because that would be the honorable thing to do. So the U.S. ambassador requests more protection for his legation. Um, and he is afraid that the Chinese, who at that time were garrisoned near Asan, might try to take back Seoul. So there's a lot of stress, I would say, at that moment. But soon, however, the Japanese defeat a Chinese army at the Battle of Pyongyang. Um, and what's interesting is that the Western dispatches have really nothing but contempt for the, the China men, quote unquote, whereas the Japanese are really seen as gallant. So how can you explain this, this dichotomy there? 
Uh, a lot of that comes back from the two newspaper men, the primary newspaper men that we have here. Two men that are actually competing with one another. You have Creel, I think he's Creel. He's reporting more anti-Japanese. He's giving more of a negative view. And then you have de Guerville. And de Guerville is traveling with the Japanese. And so he's giving a, a very positive Japanese view on everything. You're seeing that some of the witnesses see the Chinese throwing off their uniforms or running. You also have near Anzan a French missionary, a French Catholic priest, who was killed by Chinese soldiers whereas the Japanese seem to be more civilized and more humane. This changes, though, once they get into China and we have that large massacre. I, I think there, there's a lot of hatred towards the Chinese prior to 1894. The Chinese, Wan Chai Ke, is seen as being superior to everybody. He, he's the one that, when he would walk in, King Kojong had to stand up. He, he said that he could be king if he wanted to. And in fact, he had plotted to remove Kojong from his throne. The story I always like to use is that it was the prostitute section in Nagasaki that saved King Kojong's throne. The Chinese fleet sailed around to show the flag. It was a very powerful fleet. And it separated in Busan. One part went up to Vladivostok and one part went over to Nagasaki. And while they were in Nagasaki, there was a huge fight. Some of the Chinese soldiers had gone ashore and they got into a fight with the Japanese police. And that part of the fleet got held back. And that part of the fleet should have gone back and joined the main fleet at Chemyopo. And Wan Shai Ke was supposedly planning on disposing King Kojong at the time. But because of that delay, Western navies also arrived at Chemyopo and he couldn't do it. So we also learned from the letters that the Korean elite, generals, young princes, regularly come to the legation, sometimes even sure. daily. The political situation is, is dire, yes, but they seem to visit often because they, they, want, they, they want to catch a break. <laughs> they, 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 they want to catch a glimpse of Western life and maybe they find exotic. What, what do we know from, uh, of these visits? Sure, we get a lot of visitors. We get uh, King Kojong's son. He often comes to the legation. What's not in the book and comes from another series of diaries that I have, is that Wewa was learning English from a Portuguese man who was employed by the American advisor to the Korean government's law department. So we have one of the princes learning English from a Portuguese guy, which is kind of strange. Um, yeah, they came often. Everybody wanted to do the Gugyeong. They wanted to look around, see, see everything that they could. But were they really interested in Western culture, or do you think that's kind of the biased view of the wife of the ambassador? Who was... I don't know if it was so much the Western culture as the Western material items, mm -hmm. because there are clocks yeah. everywhere. In fact, um, when the German prince visited Korea, he brought a cuckoo clock, and that was a, a great prized possession. These cuckoo clocks were sold in some of the stores around Seoul, and they were extremely expensive. About this time, we also have bicycles becoming very popular. Everybody wanted to see how the Westerners were living. They wanted to see these top items. And, you know, a lot of bling. Everybody's got bling back then. Even the Korean nobility is wearing bling. Everybody's got a watch. Everybody's got... Hmm. Now, I, I, I don't think it's so much the culture, because we don't have really people imitating... The, the table manners or anything, but we do have this desire for the, the material items. The legation and Ambassador Sill in particular supported the American missionaries' involvement in Korean politics, which led uh, to criticism from the State Department, which had sent uh, specific instructions forbidding that, and actually eventually caused the ambassador his job. That's quite an interesting story at the end of the book. So what do we know about it from the letters and why did the State Department try to restrain the activities of the missionaries? Were they maybe afraid of a Japanese backlash or? Well, a lot of people are complaining about it. The Japanese are complaining. The Russians are later complaining. But again, I don't like to blame Sill for it. Mm -hmm. Sill is a weak diplomat, but he's not the one doing all this. This is Alan's story again. 
Alan's the one that's inciting all these things. He's the one that's he's keeping his name off of everything. Sill's name is on everything, but Alan is the man behind the scenes pulling all these strings. And once Sill's relieved, who's the next person? Alan. Alan yeah. takes over. And once Alan's in his position, Alan has full sway, and we see American interest rapidly developing in Korea. Ko Jong, when he goes off to the Russian legation, Alan played a part in that. But Alan never mentions it because he knows he was wrong to do so. Were the missionaries engaged in the politics? Yeah, and to some degree. They were protecting the, the nobility. They were, they were providing haven, but no more than Alan was. Alan what was, was Alan's agenda? Was it only uh, looking after his own interests? or it depends on how you're asking that question. Are you asking me from Alan's point of view, or are you asking me... From a, let's call it, historian's perspective. Because if you look from Alan's point of view, he's only furthering American mm. interest. And all of his documents are carefully done in third person, or they're very passive. Uh, you know, I didn't do that... But if you look at other people, Alan has access to crime. He uses his position to get his, what he wants. He gets revenge on people. He, he has no qualms in doing political manipulation and having certain people placed into ministerial positions in the Korean politics and court. Alan is definitely in it for himself. Even though he says, I never received any money from anything. Uh, it's not from lack of trying. And he was investigated in 1905 for using his office for his own gains. He was said to have received kickbacks. Reading your book, um, one cannot help but feel this is first and foremost a chronicle of Korea's dislocation. Japanese troops are on the streets, Chinese contingents are in the countryside, there are angry mobs around, the Tongak movement is rampaging, there are US Marines, French, British, Russian soldiers protecting their, their legations. And a Korean royalty gradually losing uh, the little grip it had uh, over the situation. So beyond the details about everyday life that we can find in, in, in the letters of the, of the Sills, would you agree that this material is really of particular significance due to its first-hand account, almost week by week, of Chosun's complete downfall? I don't think we see a complete downfall of Chosun. Hmm. Uh, I, I just see that we see a, a constant cycle of one power rising and another power falling. We see the Chinese fall from their position, the Japanese rise to their position, then we see the Japanese fall from their position when Kojong goes into the Russian legation. The Russians go up into their position, and that's about where we end for the SEALs. Hmm. But as soon as that happens, then we see the Americans rise to their situation. So it's not the complete downfall of Chosun. It's just another one of these cycles that we see. What's important about this is we're seeing it from a non-diplomatic point of view. We're seeing it from his wife's point of view, from his sister-in-law's point of view, and even from his son's point of view, because he writes some letters. It's so much of what we have from this period is done from diplomatic dispatches. They're done from the reports from the various diplomats. This is done from the home view, from somebody lower down. All by it, she does have a perspective that the average run-of-the-mill merchant didn't have. You know, she does have access to higher-level people. But it does show us how daily life is in mm. Korea, as viewed in the Chongdong area. I mean, Chongdong is a specific area. It's, it's not exactly out there on the fringes of the city wall. It is the upper area. But yeah, I, I think it's important because it's... It's a view of Korea that we haven't seen before. Did your work change the, the image you have of today's Korea, and especially how Koreans deal with their own history? I see a lot of similarities mm -hmm. in a lot of things. Um, I don't see much change in a lot of ways. Um, it, it's still the top squeezing down. It's still, once I reach my point, then I'm still going to abuse the people below me. It's... You know, if it happened to me, so it's got to happen to you. you know, once I reach my point, I'm there. It's pretty much the same. Uh, I, I don't see that much difference. Hmm. Sure, there are differences with modernization, and Koreans are more westernized now, and more 
cosmopolitan, but its base greeds are all there. We're a base people. Everybody is. There's no real difference between the Koreans and the Westerners here either. Everything that Sally sees that's negative in a Korean, I could pull back up and show you in a Westerner in the same city. They denounce dishonesty, but at the same time we have Horace Allen and his dishonesty. It's kind of hypocritical. No, I, I don't see any difference. Robert Neff, thank you so much for being our guest today. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.